coming up on Theater Talk. This is my story, a new category, to make you dance and clap your hands. This is my choir. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation and Wynette Richardson. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm Susan Haskins Doloff, and here with me is my guest co host, Elizabeth Vincent Talley, a critic for so many publications I won't list them. <laughs> Elizabeth, there is a wonderful new musical show downtown. Well, it's not downtown, it's way west in New York City, K pop. And we're going to talk about it today. Yes, and we are here with a team from K pop book writer Jason Kim, Jason Egan, who's the artistic director, founding artistic director at Ars Nova, uh, which is one of the three uh, co-producers for the show, along with the Mai Theatre Company and the Wuchet Collective. Right. And we have director of the show, uh, Teddy Bergman. Congratulations, you all. Who wants to tell us a little bit about what K-pop is? How about you, Teddy? You Probably sure. first K-pop, the phenomenon, maybe. Yes. Oh, wow. Okay. Before, sure. just, All right. Yeah. Two sentences, easy. Which I didn't know about. Um, K-pop, the phenomenon, is, it stands for Korean pop, and it is a massive sensation that originates from South Korea uh, that is uh, an addictive blend of world pop in this sort of incredible fizzy cocktail um, <laughs> that has been extraordinarily successful all over Asia, and in fact, all over the world, with the with the exception of the United States, which is uh, actually one of our founding premises for our show, yes. which is why has it not crossed crossed over to uh, the United States? Except for Psy, as you say. Yes. Right. Except for the phenomenon that was Gangnam Style for that moment. Gangnam Style. And K-pop, the show itself, is an immersive musical that asks that very question of why K-pop has not crossed over to the United States. And the, the means by which we ask that question is um, the show tells the story uh, of the launch of a K-pop label called JTM Entertainment as they are attempting to come to New York City and lay down roots um, and engage with an audience to try and figure out what the secret formula is to launching K-pop in America. <laughs> So, so, Teddy, you and Jason uh, conceived, I guess, came up with the, the concept of the show. Can you tell us a bit about that? Because it's not your linear musical or, or show. It's more like a, like a choose-your-own-adventure, almost. <laughs> Although you're guided through yeah. various tracks yes. of potential narrative. Uh, Jason and I and, and my theater company, Woodshed Collective, which is one of the uh, co-producers of the show, um, conceived uh, of the show itself, which is uh, takes the form of introducing you to the roster of artists that are on this label. So there's um, a solo artist named Mui. There's a boy band named Fate and a girl band named Special K. And the audience gets to meet, in separate parts, gets to meet all of these fabulous artists that are part of the roster. And they perform for us. They're wonderful. They certainly do. Such it's a wonderful cast. cast. Jason, mm -hmm. there's a very deep issue which is being explored. I, I mean, this is a fun I, musical. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid yeah. we're making it really dry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really it's want to so say fun. that the show is so, I found it so intoxicatingly fun. Yes. Because we're like, oh, there's different tracks and no, it's no, all no. about this phenomenon. Yeah, it's really incredible. You kick it fun. off at the beginning. We're all together, and and these these kids, what I call kids, are performing, and I'm just like bouncing and tapping. It's so wonderful. But at what point in this process did this far deeper issue of of Korean identity being threatened come in? Oh, I would say that this was a fairly recent discovery. Um, really? Well, recent as two years ago, so I guess not that <laughs> recent. <laughs> um, but I think we uh, sat around talking about what the show could be and should be for a good year, year and a half, and then we really started to pin down on the issues of uh, who are you, 
Uh, what does it mean to be outside of the box? What does it mean to be someone who's outside of the box, who's trying to be inside the box? About two years ago, and since then we've just been grinding away at that question for, uh, for as long as we can remember. Um, and uh, like Teddy said, we were trying to uh, offer a, uh, the question in this bubble bath of <laughs> pop music. <laughs> when did you come to this show? So I came in probably about four years ago. Um, Teddy invited me to a now legendary lunch <laughs> uh, and presented this idea of an immersive musical show uh, and where we would... And you the master of uh, immersive... Well, I think that... I mean, thank you. <laughs> I think, uh, yes, the, the fact that I was a fan of Woodshed Collective already and following their work and knew what they were capable of in terms of creating something unique and immersive matched with this specific idea, it felt like Ars Nova jumping in and getting involved could take it to the next level and that by coming together and adding Mai, we could, the three companies could do something that no, no one of the well, companies I think we also need alone. to remind, yes. just in case, that Ars Nova was behind Natasha Pierre and the great comet of should still be running. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, and so you had experience with the immersive musical, but, but this one takes it to a whole other level because Natasha Pierre was relatively self-contained. That's right. This one is on two floors, several rooms that are all pretty much interconnected, and as we said, on several storylines. When did it morph into this huge endeavor, or was it already... Into a house, as... into like, well, you're over at the, uh, new, the new Art New York Theater, which is this quite a Beautiful fabulous space, space. And, oh, are, and, and I feel we see every nook and cranny. Certainly do. <laughs> so uh, what does Ars Nova bring to the table? Distinctively, what is it that you and your group that they needed you and Ars Nova to do it. Lunch. Hey, let's lunch. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, Ars Nova exists to get behind really ambitious ideas from early career artists and really take big risks because we're asking the artists to take those same big risks. And so when an idea like that drops in my lap, that's an incredible opportunity for us to get behind something. So what's your job? Get money? Get uh, to, to co consult on the book? Yeah. Well, yeah. We're a nonprofit, so we're raising money like all the nonprofits. Um, and so certainly getting money together, and in this case, more money than ever. Uh, <laughs> and also to cultivate the creative team and really get behind the vision and push them further um, as a team to figure something like this out because you can't really just commission a playwright and send them away for two years and then get a draft of their commission. You really have to be hands-on and be creating this together. So and was so he calling you up and saying, hey, you guys, where are you with this oh, thing? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's an inevitable part of the process. But, I mean, I, there was when we started talking about this idea, I mean, Jason was the first person I called about the idea because Ars Nova is the place for young artists to take big risks. Can we talk a bit about the score? The score is by Helen Park and Max Vernon. And I, I've read on forums and in some reviews that the, the, the songs are pastiche and spoofs. And I was thinking, they're, they're not at all. They're straight up K-pop. They could work as K-pop singles. The, the songs themselves are not meant to be fun. I mean, they're funny and humorous, but sure. they're not meant to be parodies. And can, can you? Tell me a little bit about how you, came, you guys all worked on the score, because there's, there's a lot of songs, too. Sure. I think there are over 40 songs 40 in songs. the musical. Uh, and depending on which order you experience the show, you'll get different songs in different orders. Uh, Helen and Max are, to be blunt about it, complete geniuses and work machines, and they comprise this incredible, incredible score that is so expansive. Uh, and sounds like pop music that you hear really in the does. real world, but also does a tremendous amount of storytelling. So I think the thing that is really wonderful about their work is that it, it somehow straddles both spheres and still at the same time is its own thing. And K-pop itself b borrows re real K-pop. Right. 
borrows so many different musical forms and appropriates so many different musical forms into the genre mm -hmm. that I think if you call it pastiche, you're right, but K-pop right. is pastiche, you right, know? Right, right. And that's what they've so brilliantly mirrored in the score of the show. I hope they're going to record this. So, I hope so. Yeah, I hope so, too. Yeah. Now, <laughs> now, working on it. Is there a future for K-pop? What do you think? Is there a way that we can see this on Broadway, you know, in a divided up circle in the square or something like I, that. Jason, what do you think? I th I mean, <laughs> we have high hopes. I think Ars Nova and the partners believe deeply that there's a unique future for this show and we're pursuing that. And, and Jason, you're not embittered by the previous Broadway experience where you put up this fantastic show and were not treated as well as you should have been? Absolutely not. I think that was an incredible experience for yes. Dave and Rachel and we're so thrilled oh, to have been part of it and Natasha. it was a wonderful moment for Ars Nova. So it only helps us take big risks again on big ambitious shows like this. Yeah. I was wondering also if you've noticed that the show has been drawing maybe different audiences that you don't necessarily see oh, yeah. as at, at musicals because the energy and just the type of music that's it's music you could hear on the radio well not in the u.s but uh everywhere else in the world and it feels that to me is something that broadway never gets right you never feel like oh my god what is this i'm hearing whereas here it feels oh yes this could come out of the billboard hot 100. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we've had an amazingly i think diverse uh, audience, both ethnically, racially, and age-wise, come mm -hmm. to the show. This certainly not your typical theater audience. And one of the things I find most thrilling about Jason's book is that it's bilingual. And so there are sections of the show, right, mm -hmm. that are in English and Korean, and they blend together so beautifully. And it's so wonderful when we have Korean-speaking audiences because they get a whole inside set of jokes mm -hmm. that then reinforce this whole theme that Jason is talking about, about being inside and outside the box. Our audience gets that experience themselves by virtue of their sort of different levels of comprehension of what's going on, um, which is a, an amazing and feels like a deeply immersive experience yes. to have of this world um, that's been very, very, very gratifying. You have young artists arguing in Korean, and so those of us yeah. who don't speak Korean, we get this, but then there, that other level must be amazing. Yeah, it, it feels both exciting because there is a lack of understanding, but also that there is a level of understanding in terms of the storytelling that we're doing totally. and the way that Teddy has staged it makes sense in terms of exactly the storyline that you're following. So it's been a joy to have such a diverse ray of audiences and also no, our no, cast. Right, the cast, I was going to say, because it's an entirely Asian cast except for uh, Ebony the choreographer. Ebony Williams yeah. plays the choreographer. What's great about the show is that you still, it's a big cast because each of the bands has six members and then there's everybody else, but you still manage to create real characters in there. I mean, there's some standouts and the show allows for the, the actors to really shine and we never see that many, no, unless it's the King and I, <laughs> which is a very different thing. Mm -hmm. It does also shine a mirror that because they're aspiring to make it an American culture and the very superficial things they are seeing about American culture, which are really there. Mm -hmm. And it makes, us, you, you know, someone such as myself is looking and going, oh, isn't that sad? <laughs> That's what they want to be. Yeah, and know, this yeah. is part of the brilliance of doing it in this immersive way where the audience is part of the experience and they're really asked to confront these issues that the play is, the questions the play is asking and also just all of us being in the room together. It's really a breathtaking a display of humanity. Even including a plastic surgeon with the needle ready to shoot it into her right. right. face. All right, well, it's... <laughs> <laughs> and on that note. Yeah. <laughs> it's just wonderful, and I really hope that some audacious, big money, big money guy... Make some calls, Susan. Make some calls, <laughs> well, because there are big production, big, wonderful production numbers, too. It really needs to be seen. It is absolutely thrilling. Yeah. I, I, I've been calling it my, my spirit musical. <laughs> <laughs> I've become so obsessed glad. with Thank it, you. which is very fitting for the subject, too, because it's also a show about obsession. So, <laughs> Jason Kim, Teddy Bergman, and Jason Egan of Ars Nova. All of you have made this beautiful K-pop. Thank you so much for coming here and talking about it. Thanks I for having us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth.
Well, thank you. My one of my me. new co-hosts. <laughs> I felt I felt so strongly about that show. It was just like you have to let me do it. And now I am back here with my guest co-host, Jesse Green of the New York Times. We were in the middle of our season preview and we were having such a good time that we are doing a little more of it this week. With us is Michael Musto of NewNowNext.com, Elizabeth <laughs> Vincentelli of The New Yorker, The New York Times, Newsday, and the Three on the Isle podcast and Patrick Pacheco of the LA Times and writing a book about the 100th year of the American Theater Wing. Uh, all of the 100 years, yes. <laughs> not just the 100th year. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so we have a little more to talk about previewing the new fall season. There's a little bit more on Broadway, which we should get to, but also want to leave a little time for off-Broadway, which mm. is having a, a very exciting season. Often in the fall, that's what happens because there's less going on on Broadway. But we didn't mention uh, Latin History for Morons, which is the John Leguizamo play that played at the public last season and is now moving to Broadway. Uh, I myself was not a big fan of it. Well, I love the idea that he was now a father explaining the Latino background to his son. And again, within the context of everything that had happened. I'm embarrassed that I did not know enough about my, about my ancestry to pass on to my kids. I mean, I, I, I kind of sort of knew about our, about our land timeline. What is that? Everybody knows that, right? 1000 BC, we had Mayans, and then we have now. <laughs> and what is this, the age of Pitbull? <laughs> Dame culo, ma culo, todo el culo, san culo, todo culo, culo. He's a brilliant performer. He's been doing this for a long time. And he's been able to bring a, an element that is very rare in the theater, which is Latino theater. Uh, it's very rare that you have that. So I thought it was refreshing from that point of view. Uh, that brings me to uh, an off-Broadway thing, which is uh, something called the Sol Project, which is developing the careers of young Latino playwrights and working with a lot of the institutional theaters to actually get productions. Uh, one of which is happening at the public this fall and is a play I'm, I'm interested in. It's a take on Oedipus called Oedipus El Rey. Well, there's a new cabaret show called Oedipus Rex Reed. I love Rex. <laughs> no, yeah, we love Rex. Um, <laughs> well, there's a, I love everyone that was in Myra Breckenridge. <laughs> uh, there's the revival. There's the revival of Torch Song Trilogy off Broadway. That would which probably, is now just Torch Song. Which is because now it's just, not a trilogy. But it's not anymore. the Joan Crawford movie. <laughs> Torch Song, obviously. Um, the Harvey Firestein play, seminal play, that won the Tony Award in 1983 and is now starring Michael Urie and Mercedes Rule in the role that made Estelle... Estelle Getty. Getty, a yeah. star, a big star. So, yeah, and was, uh, I think, Harvey's neighbor or friend or something and said, put me in the play, and he did. So, so the originally, as many people know, this was three separate one-act plays that were uh, performed off-Broadway. At La Mama. Uh, s starting at La Mama and then uh, were combined into a single evening, a single long evening, and now have, because people apparently can't go to the theater for longer than two hours, <laughs> two hours and 15 minutes anymore, have been condensed somehow into a two-act uh, play of you know, the normal dimensions these days. Curious to see how that works. Well, now angels in America are just angels. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people have a shorter attention span. They want to get back on their phones. No, no, I, I'm looking forward to this. I, and um, yeah, the great thing about Estelle Getty is she didn't win any awards for it because nobody believed she was acting. Mm -hmm. She was so that character. Uh -huh. It was like Lorette Taylor or something. Where did this person wander in from? They're not acting. <laughs> So another seminal gay play that's coming back, or gay musical in this case, is When Pigs Fly, something I'm particularly looking forward to. One of the uh, craftiest and yet campiest shows of that era, which is, uh, that combination is pretty delightful. Uh, what, Did you like it? I adore the original, and it was just pure gay camp bliss. Euphoria from beginning to end, and just light on its feet, and witty, and topical. Very topical. But light. <laughs> And 
now it has costumes by Bob Mackie, who's wow. uh, riffing off of the Howard Crabtree, the mm. creators. It's so poignant. Work. The two of the people that created it, uh, Dick Gallagher yeah. and C Crabtree, are both uh, deceased. And it's also interesting, both with Torch Long Trilogy and when Pigs Fly, is now to see it within, in terms of the gaze that gays have made, the gains, excuse me, that gays have made <laughs> over the intervening decades, how it will, these productions will now play. And again, when gays and transgendered are under threat by the Trump administration. Yeah, there's uh, some question as to whether th this material will even make sense to a new generation of kids, both gay and not gay, who don't have a clue that th this sort of uh, oppression ever existed. Uh, I, I hope it does make sense to them because there's a lot of pleasure to be had in those shows. Uh, and there's new oppression that I think they're feeling, this new generation of gay men and, and women as well. There is this new oppression in terms of the, the transgender mm -hmm. and the, the right wing that are now in control yeah. of the government. Uh, Not to mention President Pants. <laughs> President SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> uh, an another show that's uh, coming off Broadway that I'm really looking forward to because I've seen it twice already in earlier incarnations is a play called The Wolves, huh? which is uh, about a high school girls soccer team. Did, did we all see it? Wonderful play. Mm. Yeah. Loved it. I oh. saw Bend It Like Beckham, the musical. <laughs> <laughs> no? It's just like that, except nothing like that. Is okay. it an import? Uh, no, it's uh, Sarah DeLapp is an American, young American it was playwright. was a Pulitzer finalist. Yes, it, uh, it, it certainly was. Year. And uh, it's a wonderful play. It's done, uh, not in the round, but you know, the audience is on both sides of the pitch. Mm. And the girls are doing drills. And the cast is actually doing, you know, they have like... Set, many balls in the air, or rather on the ground at all times. So they Sounds really like are doing. Sounds like doing. <laughs> Where is it being done? It's now being done at uh, Lincoln Center Theater. Now you were on the Pulitzer Committee. Did you vote for it? Well, yes. I, I voted to include it among the finalists. Top three. Uh, Very discreet. Yeah, well, but that's how the Pulitzers work. The Central Committee, the Politburo, uh, makes the final decision. <laughs> Bureau. We only refer a certain number of plays to them. And, and Sweat was the winner by Lynn Nottage. Sweat was the winner by Lynn Nottage. And how, how does the title relate to the play? The name of the team. It's the name of the team. Oh, it's the name. But it also, w without going too deeply into it, it reflects, the play is basically about girls coming of age through sport. And uh, you might say that it's about girls learning not to disconnect from their uh, physical selves. So the, the wolves may. It also has an amazing ear oh, for the yeah. way teen girls speak. It's absolutely mm -hmm. amazing. And especially because you have all these characters and they're all in their, you know, identical team jerseys. They each have very distinct identities. And it's really spectacular the way the, the playwrights creates, makes those very distinct Girls, so women. Well, Tina Fey doesn't have a monopoly I was just on that. Gonna say, speaking, uh. speaking of teen girls speaking, we bounce back to Broadway with it. <laughs> mean Girls is coming in already in rehearsal, so that will be very interesting. In the to spring, see. yes. Yeah, spring. in the spring. So uh, we we left out Time in the Conways from Broadway, I do believe. Right. Yes. So uh, that, that's a show that's happening right one. now. Uh, this is a play by J.B. Priestley. Uh, has anyone seen it in any other version? I have not. No, and that's no. what I love about it. I've yeah. never even heard of it, yes. and it's not Gypsy again. It's <laughs> a new, old play, and it's about a family post-war, 1919 England, optimistic, and then jumps 19 years into the future. It's one of those old standard plays of look how they've changed. And, and it's a hard-hitting play. It's, it's, it's a difficult play, and, and it has, of course, an essential role as the mother of this family, Elizabeth McGovern, playing yet another mother, uh, an aristocratic English woman, as she did in Downton Abbey. Uh, of the same period. And the same, of the same period, covering some of the same period. But it is about the disillusionment of, of the British and, and class and class struggle. Uh, and that's at the roundabout, which, to its credit, is uh, programming it in the slot where they usually put the difficult, uh, <laughs> possibly less commercial production before they move on to the, uh, the uh, holiday show. But um, I'm quite looking forward to it. I think we're out of time, basically, Jesse. I hope we didn't leave out a favorite of yours. And of course, I'm... <laughs> well, I, yeah, I, I, 
<laughs> I want to, and so you've all got to come back. If the creek don't rise, come back for our spring preview. We'll talk about Carousel and Three Tall Women. And well, what do oh we do God, if the creek rises? <laughs> and yeah. God is not willing. And God is not willing. And all this cool stuff that's coming in in the spring. The so spring is mind blowing. I've got to say, mind -blowing. the yeah. spring well, is. And we'll catch Ray up Craig. with all the shows Jesse said he's looking forward to and say, <laughs> right. why did you pan them? I'm always looking That's forward right. to them until I pan them. Until <laughs> you see them. We'll see what you kill for next time, Jesse. I have never killed the show. All right. So I want to thank you so much. My guest co-host, Jesse Green, my future guest co-host, or, or I think by the time they see this, you will have been my guest co-host. My I, guest co-host, I suppose Elizabeth Vincent Talley, my guest co-host Michael Musto, Rotating. my dear associate Patrick. I'm seeing Terry. The chopped liver over here. <laughs> yeah, I'm chopped thank liver. Thank you so much for being here and thank you all for watching. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, audience. <laughs> thank you, viewers. Good night, Moon. <laughs> it's a wrap. Thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Bowe Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, the Noel Coward Foundation, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, and the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs. We welcome your questions or comments for Theatre Talk. Thank you.